being redemptive, and these are three R's you need to understand in terms of your manhood. God has made you redemptive. He has made you receptive. And he has made you... I'm waiting for you all to get those two first. I don't want to move too fast. He's made you redemptive because we're going to have to redeem some things. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. He's made us receptive because a lot of things have been sponged into us. And we're going to talk. That's why uh, Jesus says it's not those things that go into the man that defile man, the things that come out of the man that defiles the man. And, of course, what he names in Mark 7, 20 and 21, he names 13 things that comes out of the heart. Because 13 becomes a representative number for sin. And uh, in fact, when you look at the walls of Jericho in um, Joshua chapter 5, uh, they actually circled the wall 13 times. You know, some of y'all look at the days. So, well, they, they circled it once a day for six days. And on the seventh day, they circled seven times. So actually, they circled 13 times. Jesus named 13 things in Mark 7, 20 and 21 that comes out the heart. So that means that we've got to get these things out because we have been a receptacle to some things that has sponged in us that needs to be purged out of us. That's what sanctification is all about. And so we get did those things that... And then the third R is that we need to be reclassified. We need to be reclassified. And that's important because any man being Christ is a new creature. All things are passed away and all things have become new. Now, I'm redeeming my time, so I want you to turn to um, Ezekiel 22:29. Ezekiel 22:29. Many of you probably read this passage, but I want to give you a, an illumination on, on where I'm going with this because we've got to redeem biblical manhood if we expect to redeem the society. We're dealing with some things now where sin is not covered up anymore. Everybody's proud of their sin. And, and, you know, in terms of our masculinity, we're being attacked with homosexuality. Yes, and, and I'm not afraid to talk about it because I, I've um, and being both a clinical psychologist and a theologian. I've had to deal with people on this issue quite a bit. One of the biggest arguments now in homosexuality is that we were born that way. Yeah. Well, that's OK. And uh, because all of us were born in sin and sin, you know, it's not how you were born it's how you can change. And because you were born a certain way, it don't mean you have to stay that way. Now, it is, it, is, it is a theologian by the name of Augustine, Augustine, that told us about this idea of original sin. I mean, the Bible already talked about it, just didn't use this term, original sin. But David talked about being born in sin, and in sin did my mother conceive me. But Augustine came up with a term about original sin. In other words, we have inherited throughout DNA this idea or this concept that Adam has passed on to us the perplexity to sin, which, which is good in terms of theological standpoint.
born, and that we're all born in this. So we, we really have been born with this sin nature in us. And so in, in, re, in response to that, we have to get, and this is where I'm talking about being reclassified, we have to be purged out with some things so that we can be carried into a new direction. So let me show you here, because this comes up at least three times in Scripture. I want to show you that this concept in Ezekiel 22 comes up, and it would have changed all of society had it been handled properly. And yet, in each case, God had to do disaster because this qualification was not met. And I'm going to give you a threefold qualification. Uh, Ezekiel 22, 29, the people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongly. Verse 30, and I sought for a man among them that would make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. Now, the property of, of uh, Ezekiel 24 brings in five categories. Five, let's say five is the number of grace. I'll deal with some numerology too. So in verses, you can just highlight these verses in, in um, Ezekiel 22 so I can show you what, what is, uh, came up to this. In verses 6 and 25, he included the princes, princes who were messing up. In uh, verse 26, he talked about the priests. So not only the civil leaders, but the religious leaders. And then he talked about the government officials in verse 27. In verse 28, he talked about the prophets. And in verse 29, we just read, he talked about the people. The land had gotten so wicked. And here's the thing. God is not, was not looking for everybody to become holy. He was looking, verse 30, get this man, he was looking for a man. A man. He was looking for a representative man who would then stand in the gap and say three things. Here's the three things God is looking for. Because in the text, this is what has to happen in, in chapter 22. Since I have to fast forward, I don't have time to give you the background. But I'll, I will share with you the three things that has to happen to make you recover your biblical manhood. If we can be this in our home, in our church, in our workplace, we can be that representative person who becomes an intercessor. Yes, who can stop the degradation that is going around. First of all, God was looking for a man of credibility. He was looking for someone to be credible. And you, you talked about Pastor Leak in terms of having a good name. That's credibility. So he was looking for someone to be credible. What makes you, what makes one credible? What makes one credible is what people perceive that you are. And what they perceive is what you project. So your projection is going to make you credible in terms of what they perceive. Look, when Saul was elected king of Israel, when they were looking for someone to be king, his credibility was he stood head and shoulders taller than any man in Israel. So his credibility to be a king was that he was a giant. That's what made him credible. And what you don't understand, while you keep going in that little story about David and Goliath, and I've been saying this a lot because people don't seem to understand, that when they challenged Israel with Goliath, it was because Saul was a giant. He was a cowardly giant, but they were matching Goliath to the other giant that Israel had. So, so Goliath was challenging Israel not in a uncontest battle, but because Saul was the giant there, we went and got our giant. Now let's let the giants fight and decide the issue. So the credibility was, we're going to find someone that's credible with Saul, and we're going to challenge Israel with him. And Saul, of course, is a cowardly giant, so he really doesn't have credibility, even though he looks the role, he doesn't act the role. I don't know how many of you all get that, but you, know, you wake up 2, two o'clock in the morning and you, you realize he said something. 
Because what I'm trying to get you to understand is this credibility role is so important, which is why there are three times that God deals with this credibility issue in Scripture. Let me give them to you. The first one is in Genesis 2 with, with Adam. Uh, let's go Genesis chapter 2 and 3. I don't have time. To, I'm going to outline a little bit. But the second time is in Genesis 19 when, when Abraham is bargaining to save Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says, if there just be ten righteous men, will you not destroy the city? He is not going to destroy the two cities who are wicked if he can find ten people of credibility. You understand what I'm saying? Credibility has such an issue that it can represent your home, it can represent your church, it can even represent your job. Because of the credibility issue, God will pass over. Because he's got one credible man. You can have the worst children in the world, but because you're credible. I don't even have time to talk about Joe with his children who were partying and messing up, and, and God saw him as the intercessor for his own because of his uh, credibility. Oh, well, let me give you the other two right fast because I'm, I'm going to wrap this up real quick because I know some of you come from a long, long way. I don't have time. I, I have to take time to really build uh, biblical manhood. Doctor just hit some things that I, I, I really want to hit in terms of that glory, so I, I'll have to get there in a minute. But uh, give me a minute. Hold your finger right there because I want to... <laughs> I, I got to get to that part because I got to show you what man really is. See, the reason that man was created, of all that God did in the universe, of all his amazing attributes, of all the things that God was and that God is and that God will be, the one thing that God could not do in his universe that he made you and I for, that was visibility. God could not be seen. His glory was so great, and the Hebrew word for glory is the word kabod, which, which has a metamorphosis, because the etymology of the word kabod means to be weighed down and to be made light. Now, how are you going to be made weighty and light at the same time? So kabod means to be weighed, and it also means to be made light. You're weighted with guilt because of the kabod, but you lift it up in God's presence as he lifts you away from the guilt that you had into a new understanding of who you are. Now, he brightens up because God amazingly could be heard. He could be felt. He could not be seen. He created man in his image and likeness to do the one thing in the universe that he had not been able to accomplish any other time because he had never made himself visible. He decided with man to do what we call in theology anthropomorphism. Anthro is Greek for man. Pomorphism means appear. So that God, when he came in, he first wanted to get it through the man, he messed up because he messed up his credibility, and I'm going to get to the other two points of what he messed up, because if, once you get those three together, you become in the place that God can be seen through your life. Because when I get through in the next 10 minutes, I want to show you how to get God seen in you. Because the issue is to get, is to get God seen and not be seeing you, but so that God can be seen in you. Because see, in the Old Testament, God appeared as a man. He performed anthropomorphism as a man in the Old Testament. When that didn't work, he literally became a man. So the New Testament talks about his theophanies. God appeared as a man. The, the, uh, the Old Testament worked with theophany. The New Testament works on what we call incarnation, which means God actually became a man. He did not become, in Greek mythology, a demigod, where he was part man and part God. He became a full man and a full God. I'll give you another theological term. It's called hypostatic union, which means that God was man and God at the same time. He never stopped being God to become a man. He didn't put his deity on hold to become a man. And he didn't put his humanity on hold to stop being God. He was both at the same time. And so how could that be? Well, if he's God, he can do whatever he wants. <laughs> 
But he always looks for channels. You see, it's not that God can't do anything. It's how he chooses to do it. And so how he chooses to be seen was through a creation that he crowned it more than anything else. Psalm 8, what is man that you are mindful of? This is the angels talking. They wanted to know out of all the things that you created, why are you putting up with this creation that constantly is messing up? What is so credible about this one? Hebrews 2 answers the question of Psalm 8. That who is, what is man in your mind if you made him a little bit angels, but man that he made, that he made credible, that Adam couldn't be, was Jesus Christ. Because Hebrews 2 answers the question of Psalm 8. Psalm 8 asks what is man, which is never really asked. It becomes a rhetorical question in the psalm because it never gets an answer. A rhetorical question is a question that, that doesn't have an answer. You add, even because it can't be supplied or it's implied. So in this case, man then needs this answer that goes throughout scripture. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? We gave some total of life. Our credibility then is the issue. Who are we? So we, want, we, we need to get our credibility. Who are we? We are, we, are, we are in this light of understanding credibility. Let me give you the other two right fast. Credibility is what God is looking for. Second, he is looking for accountability. And third, he is looking for responsibility. Credibility, accountability, and responsibility. Let's explore all three of those for a minute. I told you about your credibility. Your credibility is what people see about you. That's what makes you credible. You're credible because what they, they see, see, they see about it. Now, he could have, this doctor could have all the labels he wants, but if he didn't talk the language and he didn't have the knowledge of what he had, you wouldn't believe that he's a doctor. It's not just based on the certificate that he has, but what comes out of him lets you know that he knows what he's talking about. That's his credibility. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And see, the problem today is that we got too many people using labels without credibility. And Jesus said, you judge my credibility by two things. If you really look at, at John 8, Jesus said, here are two things you judge my credibility. If you don't believe me for my words, believe me for my works. It's not just what I say, but it's what I produce. So your credibility has got to be on two issues. Now, your, what you match, your good name, what you say has got to be matched out by what you do. If you give a promise, you must fulfill that promise. Whew. Accountability, what does that mean? It means it's the difference in whether or not you demand or you command. Let me say that again, man. It's the difference between whether or not you demand or you command. We're raising a whole generation that are making demands on what they can't command. Because if you can command it, you don't have to demand it. I demand my rights. We got a whole generation worrying about rights. They don't understand. So they ain't been through civil rights things. They ain't grew up like, like I did and find out when you had to go to a counter and get your food and go, go, couldn't sit down with everybody else and they demanding to have rights. And I just want this. I, want, I deserve this. I got a right for this. You don't have to demand anything if you are commanded. He gave man the ability to command with his mouth. Instead, we demand with our hands. Because the curse was that you were going to work the ground, the till of the ground, until you die. Because what you were doing before that, if a curse was to work, what was Adam doing?